Hey everyone, welcome to this week's message. We're so happy that you've joined us here online. This past Sunday, we started a new series called Light, but unfortunately due to technical difficulties, we were unable to capture it live. But just for you, Pastor Richie's gonna bring it one more time. But before we get into that, I wanna take this moment to remind you about this Saturday. We have our annual Christmas production called Spectacular. It's gonna be awesome, it's gonna be big. If you've been around Avalon Church for any length of time, you know we like to do Christmas big every year. So this Saturday at 6 p.m., invite somebody, bring your family, bring your friends, bring them out as we bring in the Christmas season together. It's gonna be big, it's gonna be spectacular. Well, here's this week's message. Enjoy it. Thank you for joining us here at Avalon Church. Whether you join us in person or you join in with our online community, we are so glad that you are part of what's going on here at Avalon Church. Now, I want to bring a challenge to all of those in our online community. And there are some that watch from all across the country, some that watch in other parts of the world. Um, But I want to challenge you in this aspect. Don't just spectate, but participate. Don't just spectate, but participate. It's easy to be a spectator. You know, when we go to a football game, we're spectators. We don't actually participate in the game. Uh, We're not on the field. We're not calling plays. We're not running plays. But we sit up in the stands and we just kind of give our own commentary about the game. Either we cheer because we think they did something good, or we complain because they don't win or uh, they're not doing what we think they should be doing. And it's easy as a Christian to be a spectator. But I want you to understand that God calls Christians to be participators, not just spectators. In other words, we don't need to sit on the sideline but we need to get involved in the game. And that is incredibly, incredibly important, no matter where you are, no matter where you join us from. Now, people join us online in our online community for different reasons, some because of health, some because of work schedule, others because of where they're located, uh, some because of the pandemic. No matter what it is that your reason is for participating online, I want to challenge you to participate. We have a saying here at Avalon Church that participation is membership. Another thing we say is that inviting is evangelism. So there are two ways I want to challenge you to participate. Number one is to invite. And that's true for everyone in the room or for those that are joining us online. We believe that you should invite people. Now, how do you do that? Well, um, you obviously that are watching online, you have the ability to watch on a phone or the computer or uh, on YouTube or on your television. And so if you have that ability, that level of technological ability, then you also have uh, the ability to invite somebody. Send a text, send an invitation, tell them to go to avalonchurch.net or on our social media pages and YouTube pages as Avalon Church GA. And so you can participate. Now, that's one way, so I want to encourage you to do that. Here's a second way you can participate. You can pray. And I want to encourage you today by praying with you. And what I want to pray about is for the people that have experienced the devastation of the tornadoes recently. There have been so many people that have lost lives. They've lost loved ones. Uh, Others have lost property. Now, property is not as important as people, that's for sure. But when you lose property and you lose your job and you lose all sense of normalcy, it can be devastating in your personal life. I know this from experience. When I was 12 years old, uh, our family, two days before Christmas, had our house burned. We lost everything. And so thank God that we were a part of a Christian community that came together and helped us and they uh, helped supply our needs and helped encourage us. And so you can do the same thing. So I want to start out today's message by praying for those that have been impacted by these tornadoes. Let's join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray now for all of those across our nation that have experienced this devastation from these tornadoes. Lord, so many have lost their lives. There are many families that have lost loved ones. Others have lost property or they've lost their ability to go to work. And so, Father, I pray that you would, through the power of the Holy Spirit, send peace, For those that have lost loved ones, 
provide for those that have lost property and possessions. And while that's not nearly as important as people, Lord, they still experience loss. And so, Lord, I pray that you would get glory from this. I pray that you would help people to point to you, to look to you, to come to you. I pray that this will be a a moment that people turn to Jesus Christ as their Savior. And they turn to their Heavenly Father to provide their needs. And Father, we'll thank you for what you do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us on this brand new series that we're starting today. And the title of the series is called Light. And we're talking about how Jesus is the light of the world. And that is a very important theme at Christmas time. Now, over the next two weeks, the next two weekends, I want you to make sure that you join me. Next Sunday, I'm going to talk about you are the light of the world. You have been called by God to be light. We're not the light, but we reflect the light of Jesus Christ, and we're going to look at that. And then on Christmas Eve, we're not having our Sunday morning services on the 26th, but we're moving all of our weekend services to the Christmas Eve. We're going to have a spectacular service. It's going to be wonderful. On that Christmas Eve service, I'm going to talk about the power of light, what it has the power to do, how it has the power to change your life. So I hope you'll be a part of that, and I hope you'll invite somebody to watch with you, those of you that are uh, joining us in our online community and those of you that join us in the room. I hope that you will invite somebody to be with us uh, on those weekends. Now today, I'm going to talk about this topic, Jesus is the light of of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. Now, light kind of goes along with Christmas, does it? Doesn't it? I mean, I love lights at Christmas time. I love the Christmas lights on the Christmas tree. I love riding through neighborhoods and seeing people with all their lights outside and the decorations. And I love going to special displays where you see lights. I, I love lights at Christmas time. And at Christmas, I have a particular tradition. Do you have Christmas traditions? I know I do. One of the things that I do every year at Christmas is I watch some Christmas movies. Now, I'm not going to tell you all the Christmas movies that I watch because some are good and some are on the Lifetime channel, all right? I tease all the ladies that love those Lifetime movies. Uh, But I love Christmas movies, but there are seven that I'm going to give you today that I will list in the Descending Order of Awesomeness. Now, these are not the only Christmas movies that I've ever watched, but they are ones that I watch every single Christmas, and they're awesome. And uh, I'm going to give you a bonus one because I don't watch it every year, but it's kind of a Christmas movie. Actually, it happened at Christmas, and that's the movie Die Hard. You may be a traditionalist, and you think that's a terrible, terrible analogy of making Die Hard a Christmas movie, but I love that. And so here is my list. Now, I wonder if you agree with it or disagree with it. Number seven, the seventh most awesome Christmas movie of all time is Home Alone. Have you ever watched that movie? I love that movie. It does beg the question how an entire family can leave their little boy at home while they go to Europe. I don't know how that happens. Um, sure, they weren't nominated for Parents of the Year, but that is an awesome Christmas movie. Maybe you've seen that one as well. Number six, and this is one of my favorite Christmas movies ever, Christmas Vacation, uh, Christmas with the Griswolds. Have you ever watched that? It is hilarious. And for those of us that have family, uh, you know that it kind of just brings, uh, brings to light how we feel about some of our family members. And so uh, number six is Christmas Vacation. Number five, this is a classic, It's a Wonderful Life. Now, I love this movie, and I realize it's a very old movie, but I watch this movie every year. It is so good, and it makes you feel good when you watch it. Number four, and this movie is very funny, it's The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. That is the Jim Carrey version. Uh, I love it. It's hilarious. makes me laugh. makes me feel warm on the inside, thinking about Christmas and Cindy Lou Who and and all of that that goes along with that. Just a wonderful movie. Uh, So that's number four. Number three, another hilarious movie, is Elf. I love Elf. He is so enthusiastic about Christmas, 
makes me enthusiastic about Christmas as well and have the Christmas spirit. Just a wonderful movie. Uh, And number two, one of my favorites, actually number two favorite of all time, is The Santa Claus starring Tim Allen. I love that movie. I watch it every year. It makes me laugh. It makes me nostalgic. It sometimes even makes me cry. And I love that movie. It's a wonderful movie and uh, just a wonderful tradition to watch at Christmas time. And then number one, the number one movie for me of all time is Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Now, I know you're probably wondering how a man of my age would watch a stop-motion movie made in 1964 every year And the answer is, I watched it for the first time when I was four years old, and I remember how it made me feel. I was devastated that they did not let poor Rudolph play in any reindeer games. It was, I I just remember what that was like, and uh, I've been a fan and on Rudolph's side and pulling for him ever since. One of the things that I loved about Rudolph was the light of his nose. And that brings us to what we're going to be talking about today, the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. Now, don't forget that the tradition behind um, lights at Christmas time uh, doesn't come from holiday parties, doesn't come from people who like to decorate. Actually, Martin Luther, the father of the Protestant Reformation, is credited with putting lights, actually candles, Uh, on the Christmas tree, and they brought it actually inside. I don't know how they didn't burn their house down, but he knew that this represented the light of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, and so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Jesus is the light of the world. So we're going to read two passages that I don't want you to to miss the significance of them. Uh, The first one is we're going to read a couple verses, and the person being quoted here is a man named Simeon. Simeon was a very old man, and he was working at the temple at the time Jesus was born, and previous to that, God had given him a vision. He had let Simeon know that he would not die until he saw the Christ, the Messiah of God. Now, that's a pretty big um, reveal. That's a pretty big dream, and so we're going to read what he says about Jesus being the light of the world. And then we're going to read what Jesus himself, 30-something years later, actually said about being the light of the world. So begin with me in Luke chapter 2, verse 29. It says, Sovereign Lord, this is Simeon talking, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation. We all are able to see the salvation of the Lord only because Jesus is the light of the world, only because the Son of God became human, and He he came into close proximity to us and for us, and He lived a life that we should have lived and died a death that we should have died. He fulfilled everything necessary to fulfill the law and to pay the penalty of sin, to absorb the wrath of God, and to extend the love of God to us. He said, I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared, notice, for all people. Not just good people, not just moral people, not just church-going people, not just American people. He has prepared for all people. Do all people get saved? No. But God loves the world. He loves everyone. And so he prepared it for everyone. And then here's what he said, talking about Jesus. He said, he is a light to reveal God to the nations. And that word nation is talking about people groups. In other words, every person in the world, Jesus came to reveal God. And as the light, he reveals God to all people. And he is the glory of God of your people, Israel. Now we're going to fast forward. We're going to read something that Jesus Christ himself said. This is 30-something years later. And Jesus um, is at a feast called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Festival of Booths. I'm going to explain what that is in just a minute. 
And he makes an astounding statement in front of people. And I'm going to explain the backdrop in just a minute. So it's going to be really good. John chapter 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. And whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, Jesus claimed to be the light of the world. Others said that Jesus was the light of the world. Old Testament prophets prophesied that the Messiah would be the light of the world. So what does that mean when it talks about the light of the world? Well, I want to show you three things from this passage that I think will help us understand the completeness of what Jesus does for us and how he reveals the Father to us and how he is the light of the world. The first thing is this. Jesus is the light of creation. Now, we read from the Gospel of John where Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And John was one of Jesus' disciples, and he wrote the Gospel of John. And in John's Gospel, he portrayed Jesus Christ not only as the Son of God, not only as the Messiah, not only as the Savior of the world, but he portrayed him as the light of the world. And so we're going to see in the first chapter of John, the very first verses of John, how it sets Jesus up as the light of the world because he is the creator. Now, why is that important? Because as creator, uh, God is in control of all things. All the way back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. In Genesis chapter 2 and 3, it talks about how that uh, God talked among himself. Now, what does that mean? Are there multiple gods? No, there's just one God, but it gives us a, a picture, a foreshadowing of the triune nature of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He said, let us make man in our image. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters, and God created. So as the creator, he is in charge of all things. He has the authority uh, to bring light to us. So understand what John was doing here in John chapter 1, verse 1. He says, in the beginning was the Word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Doesn't that reflect back to Genesis chapter 1? God, the first day of creation, said, let there be light. And there was light. He declared it. He spoke it. And so in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. I love how in the Bible... Uh, many of the authors have a, they have a habit, if you will, a practice of stating a positive and then stating the same way in a negative. They'll say uh, one way that this is what it is and this is what it's not. Or without this, this proves what he is. So uh, John used that. He said all things were made through him. And here's the negative. Without him was not anything made that was made. So he is the creator and as creator, he has all power. In him was life. Now, this is important. You see, in Jesus, in God was life. In fact, he is life. Uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father unless he comes through me. Now, why is that important? Because why death entered the world is because of sin. Why death? Because it's the opposite of life. Sin is the opposite of God's holiness. Uh, so the only possible wage for sin was death. And God said, you may eat freely of the garden of any tree that you choose, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because the day that you do, the day that you choose that, the day that you sin, you'll die. So it says, in Jesus was life. He gave the light and the life of creation. He spoke the worlds into existence. He is the source of life. And because of sin, because of Adam and Eve's sin, we have sin passed upon us. And therefore, the Bible says, all die. Death was introduced. 
But Jesus is the opposite of death because he is the life. And it says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men, of mankind. Jesus is the light. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Aren't you glad that darkness cannot overcome Jesus? Darkness cannot overcome him. The darkness of spiritual ignorance, spiritual blindness, it cannot overcome him and his purpose and his power. Uh, the darkness of sin, uh, the darkness of wandering far from God, it cannot overcome the light. It cannot overcome God's purpose, which he sent Jesus into this world to reconcile us back to the Father. Darkness cannot overcome the light. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Well, Jesus is the light of creation. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it means he's God, okay? He's God. Um, you don't have to wonder about that. Jesus claimed to be God. The scriptures show us that he was God. He proved through his acts and his action and his miracles that he was God. He had all power over nature, over death, over life. He is God. And as a result of that, you can trust him. Number two, he is sovereign. He's in control. And so whenever life feels like it's spiraling out of control, just understand this. You can't see the future, but God can. He knows everything that you're going to face today and tomorrow and a year from now and at the end of your life. He knows what we don't know. He's sovereign, and as a result, we can trust him. We can trust him in the middle of our sorrow, in the middle of our loss, in the middle of our storm. And then he is all-powerful. As creator, he has all power. So Jesus is the light of creation. Here's the second thing. Jesus is the light in darkness. Now, the Bible often uses metaphors like darkness uh, to describe our spiritual state, the sinful state that we're in. And he's talking about spiritual blindness or spiritual darkness. And so Jesus is the light in darkness. And I told you I was going to explain uh, the backdrop when Jesus said that he was the light of the world, I, this kind of gives me goosebumps when I think about it. I'm going to tell you about the Feast of Tabernacles or the Festival of Booths. It was a time every year, it was a big celebration, and they would celebrate it in Jerusalem for an entire week, okay? And so uh, people from all over the nation would come. There could have been hundreds of thousands of people there. There could have been over a million people there. But there were lots and lots of people that were there for that celebration. And in fact, it was required by Jewish law that they celebrate this Feast of Tabernacles or this Festival of Booths. And so what it represented was the time that the Israelites were delivered by God from Egypt and they wandered in the wilderness. And they wandered for 40 years, mainly because of their disobedience is the reason it took that long. But they wandered for 40 years, but God was with them. And they didn't live in houses. They didn't go to a place and build a, a brick house, but rather they lived in tents. And so the festival of booths or the Feast of Tabernacles represented and reminded them of the time that they lived in tents. And so what they would do every year, they would build shelters and they would spend the night in these shelters. Now, they would build it sometimes out of leaves, sometimes out of sticks, sometimes against the wall of their house, sometimes against the wall of the city or outside the city area. Uh, but they did that to remind themselves of the power of God and that he has the power to deliver and to save. All right? So that was the reason for uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, on the last day, it was called the Great Day of the Feast. And on that last day, what they would do is they would come together and celebrate, and the priests would go to the Pool of Siloam, which was there close to the temple, and they would dip a pitcher in water, and they would bring it to the altar, and they would pour this water on the horns of the altar. The, the altar had horns that people could hold on to or, or whatever, but they would pour the water on the horns of the altar... And every Jewish person knew 
that this represented, this pouring of this water represented the pouring out of the Holy Spirit or the coming of the Messiah or the fact that God would save his people. Okay? So that was the meaning behind it. Now, what they would do during this time is the priest, it's very dramatic, the priest would come, people would be gathered and watching, and when they would pour, the priest would pour the water on the altar, the people would sing a psalm. They would do what is called antiphonal praise. In other words, one side would uh, say one phrase of a psalm that talked about God's salvation, and the other side would say the next phrase, or one side would say one, they'd say that uh, phrase, and the other side would repeat it. Kind of like if you go to a ball game and, you know, the, the crowd there is chanting back and forth. Well, that's what they did. And I want you to see what Jesus said on that great day of the feast. Uh, right before he said, uh, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 7, verse 37, it said on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out. Now remember, everybody's watching. This is the climax of the feast. And everybody knew that the water represented the power of God, the Holy Spirit coming, the salvation of the Lord. And listen to what Jesus said. And he didn't whisper it. He didn't say it where a dozen people could hear. The Bible says he cried out with a loud voice. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, can you imagine how shocked they were when Jesus said that? You know what he was doing? He was claiming to be God. He was claiming to be the one who saves. He was claiming that he was the fulfillment of the prophecy that the Messiah would come. And then on the next day, after the feast was over, people were still around. In light of, because we know this because of where he said it, in that court area, there was what is called on the outside uh, of the temple. On the inside, there was a menorah, which is a seven-pronged candlestick. And on the outside, there was a replica. It was a gigantic light, seven prongs, and they would light it at night. People could see the light for miles around. And in an eye shot of that giant menorah, which represented the light of the world, which represented the Messiah coming, the Savior of the world. Listen to what Jesus said. And again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light in darkness. He's the light for the spiritually blind. Listen to Matthew 4, 16. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, talking about Jesus. And for those who lived in the land where death casts its shadow, a light has shined. Death casts a shadow. You and I have all experienced it. We either have experienced it personally in our own lives, in our immediate family, or with a friend or a loved one. Death casts a shadow. It casts a pall. It discourages and depresses. It makes people lose hope. It makes people be filled with sorrow. But notice what Jesus said, that those who live in the land where death casts a shadow, a great light, not a, not a little light, a great light has come. What does that mean? Well, I believe it means that Jesus gives us hope but it also means that Jesus is the way of salvation. We only come to the Father through him, not by joining the church, not by being a good person, not by keeping the Ten Commandments, but through faith in that light, through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. He's the light for the religious, those religious Pharisees that so often persecuted him. They needed saving just like the immoral. He's light for the immoral. Did you know that right before the passage that we read today, Jesus was there at the Feast of Tabernacles, the Festival of Booths, and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in the act of adultery. And they threw her at his feet. They were trying to trap Jesus. And I love what Jesus said. They said to him, hey, the law says we're to stone this woman to death. They didn't bring the man, just the woman, that was obvious about what their motive was. 
They wanted to fool Jesus. They wanted to trap him. They wanted to make, make him look bad in the eyes of the people. And they said to him, the law commands that we stone this woman. And I love how Jesus responded. He said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And the Bible says that he began to stoop down and write with his finger in the sand. Now, we don't know what he wrote, but I imagine he probably wrote things that the, the religious Pharisees knew. They thought nobody else knew. They thought no one had discovered them. No one had found out their sin. Jesus was writing in the sand. The Bible tells us that beginning with the eldest to the youngest, they all left. When he stood back up, he looked at the woman. He said, where are your accusers? She said, no one accuses me, Lord. He said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Jesus is the light in darkness. If you are in spiritual darkness today, Jesus is the light that will bring you to the Father, that will fill that empty void in your soul that no amount of money can fill, no amount of earthly success can fill, no amount of popularity can fill, no relationship on this earth can fill, only a relationship with God can fill that God-shaped void in your soul. Jesus is the light in darkness. And then the last thought is this. Jesus is the light for all the world. All the world. He's the light for all. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We all are familiar with that verse. And I love what that word world means. We think, well, he loves everybody. But the, the actual definition of that word means people associated with a world system. So anyone associated with this earthly system that the devil, the God of this world, Jesus died for them. He loved them. And then it says, it means people estranged from God. You may feel like that you're too far from God, but you're not. God loves those that are estranged from him. You may feel like you've done too many wrong things, too many bad things, but you haven't. It's not too late. You've not gone too far. You've not done too much. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He's the light for all, and then he's the light for you. I'm going to end today with Ephesians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, and it shows us how we can live with that light, receive that light, and what God does when we truly understand and believe in that light. Ephesians 3, 18, and may you have the power to understand. That's key. You've got to understand that God loves you. You've got to understand that Jesus came for you. As God's, all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. You cannot get away from it. It is so wide, you can't go too far. It is so deep, you cannot sink too low. It is so great that no matter what you have done, the love of God can reach you. Jesus is the light for the world. He is the light for you. And he says, may you experience the love of Christ. And by the way, it's one thing to know about the love of God. It's one thing to know about God, to know about Jesus. And it's another thing to experience him. And my prayer for you is that you'll experience the light of the world. He said, uh, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Wouldn't it be great if your life was complete? Oh, that doesn't mean that everything's going to be perfect in your life. You're still going to grow older. You're still going to have problems that you have to face. Wouldn't it be great if your life, if you got such a picture of Jesus that you understood how full your life really is, of how blessed your life really is, my prayer for you this Christmas 
is that you will understand the fullness of the love of God. And not just understand it, but experience it too. And that is my prayer for you because Jesus is the light of the world. Well, as I begin to wrap this up and pray, what is God speaking to you about? Maybe he spoke to you about his love. Maybe he spoke to you about light. Maybe he spoke to you about something else. But would you respond in this prayer time to God and let him know what it is that he impressed on your heart? And secondly, maybe today you need to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior because he is the light of the world. He is a light for those in spiritual darkness. And so my prayer for you today is that you will turn to him for salvation. You say, how do I do that? Well, the Bible tells us that Jesus did everything necessary, and what you and I must do is respond in faith. Now, don't worry. A lot of times people pray and say, well, I don't know if I had enough faith. Well, if you ask God for the faith, not only will he save you, he'll give you the faith that you need to trust in Jesus. And so maybe you would say something like this, dear Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you're the light of the world. I believe you died on the cross for my sin to not only forgive me, but to reconcile me to the Father and that you resurrected from the grave. And today I'm asking you to come into my life, lead my life, change me, Father, forgive my sins, and let me start a new life with you. If you'll pray that prayer, I hope you'll click on the bottom of, uh, of the, the, the program there and just say, I pray to receive Christ today. Let us know about it, and um, we'll rejoice with you. We'll help you take your next step. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that Jesus is the light of the world. Thank you that we can't be too far. We can't do too much where your love will fail to reach us. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to believe and to know and to experience that you are the light of the world. I pray for all of those that are watching that you would speak to them, help them to respond in obedience. For those that need to be saved, may they trust you today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being a part of the service today. Don't forget, the next two weeks, I'm going to talk about you are the light of the world and the power of light. God bless you. I love you. And we'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.